Before we go to the invasion of Nadesha in India and its results on the polity of the Marathas, it is perhaps necessary to look a bit backward to the different stages of Maratha policy of expansion and also the different uh, opinions within the Maratha polity itself, including the contradiction in the Maratha movement. The Maratha policy of expansion has been divided into three stages. The first stage, from the death of Shivaji to 1719, whose first half was full of the question of survival and the second half gradually sees the expansion of the Maratha attempt in the Karnatak, in the Deccan, in Malwa, as well as in other places. The second stage of this Maratha expansion is from 1720 to 1741, the Peshwashir Ship of Bajirao. And in this particular stage, the entire seed of the Maratha imperialism, the entire contradiction within the Maratha movement, the other problems, all these come out during this period. The third stage and the last one is from 1741 to the third battle of Panipat. First we will see very briefly the nature of the Maratha movement after Shivaji. The Maratha movement was a very complex one. It was complex because it started with a socio-religious reform movement with some cry for independence, for good administration and so on and so forth. These were not a very consistent one in that sense and it involved much of religious thought, but it sees itself in the Shivaji's policy of Sarajya, in the Shivaji's policy of Hindu Pad Pad Shahi. But along with this, after the death of Shivaji, the principal problem was the peasants. Due to the Mughal invasion, the Maharashtra or the Hindu Rajya of Shivaji was almost devastated. And after the death of Shivaji, the peasants were neglected and their condition deteriorated. It is in this situation that we see the attempts of the Maratha Sardars. During the first stage, particularly in the second half of the first stage, we see that the Maratha Sardars were making their own attempts individually without a central leadership to the North Indian possessions, the possessions of the Mughals, the Mughal territories, etc. These Maratha Sardars were becoming more or less autonomous. Earlier they were under the rigorous control of Shibaji, but now they are autonomous and they do not want to lose their autonomy. Actually, these Maratha Sardars come from very humble families, some almost without any education proper in that sense. And they are not concerned with the 
socio-religious reforms. They are not concerned either with the peasants, unless it touches his own interest. So therefore, there is a contradiction between the dominant element of the Maratha polity, the Maratha Saddhas, and the basic element of the socio-religious reforms that particularly inspired Shivaji to his Sarajya. Now, in this stage, in this situation, Bajirao, when he took over, there was the problem of determining the Maratha policy. What would be the Maratha policy? There were two persons in the court of the king. One was the Peshwa, Bajirao, and the other was the Pratinidhi, Sripat Rao. Sripat Rao's point of view was that the Maratha state has been devastated. First, the army and the finances should be strengthened. The Mughals should not be provoked. And Nizam should be kept friendly. He suggested that the Siddhis of Janjira should be first conquered as they are advancing from the coast. Bajirao opinion was exactly opposite. Bajirao said the Mughals were totally dependent on the Marathas. They are asking help from the Marathas all the time. Nizam will be surrounded if we get Gujarat and Malwa and he will be cut off from Delhi. He is then of no power. Siddhis of Janjira, they could be kept under control with the household troops. They are not serious fighters, particularly in the coast. And the only problem was the Karnatak. But the Karnatak had, has no money. So the money and the riches, these are in the north of India. So therefore, he stated that the Maratha policy should be to plunder the rich areas of the north, to get the financial strength and ultimately the uh, Marathas will plant their flag on the bank of the Indus. This was the vision of the Hindu Pad Pad Shahi. But Bajirao was a very practical man. He knew that this was not practicable at the moment. Later one may see, but now at the moment this is not so. So therefore he did not want to provoke the Nizam to a great extent. And as we have seen last time, that Nizam was defeated, he agreed to pay money, and Bajirao agreed to that. There was a good case of friendship even. In 17... 27, when Nizam came back from Delhi, his deputy Mubariz Khan resisted him, but with the help of Bajirao, Nizam killed him and got the throne of the Deccan. The friendship started, but the friendship had one problem, that both of them, that is Bajirao and Nizam, they wanted Karnatak they wanted to control Karnatak. So therefore, Karnatak remained as a bone of contention between them. Meanwhile, in the Mughal camp, two parties had already been formed. One is the war party and the other is the peace party, meaning thereby that the war party wanted war with the Marathas and the peace party wanted peace with the Marathas. In the war party, the most prominent one was uh, Nizam, then Sadat Ali Khan of Awadh, then the Wazir Kamaruddin Khan, etc. In the peace party, 
they were led by Jai Singh of Jaipur and Khani Doran, the Mir Bokshi. The emperor so long was leaning towards the peace party and Jai Singh tried to broker a peace between the Mughal and the Marathas in 1728, but that failed. And now, in 1735, after the debacle of the Nizam, there was some peace, and Bajirao himself went to Malwa. His mother had gone on a pilgrimage to North India, and Bajirao's policy was to contact the members of the peace party to speak in their favor. We must remember that Bajirao did not want to change the Mughal emperor. It has been said that Bajirao's policy was to plant a Hindu king in the throne of Delhi. That is absolutely not correct. Bajirao was a very practical man. He understood that although the Marathas speak of the Hindu kingdom, but it is impossible to plant a Hindu on the throne of Delhi. So therefore what Bajira wanted, but first of all to use the Mughal emperor to increase his own demands, he increase his own prestige. It is to this policy that Bajira adhered to. Now, in 1736, Bajirao gave the proposal to the Mughal court from Malwa that Malwa practically should be given to him. And the Mughal court, particularly the Mughal emperor, then leaning towards the peace party, agreed. But Bajirao, at the last minute, again gave a fresh proposal which meant that the Mughals would practically be out of Malwa and Gujarat and they would have to pay a lot of money. This angered the Mughal emperor and he now began to lean towards the war party. Bajirao came back from Malwa, waited there for one year, then came back and then started for North India. He reached Agra in 1736. The Mughals sent a huge army and as I have said last time, Bajirao bypassed them and reached before the gate of Delhi. He did not want to sack Delhi. He merely wanted to show his power to the emperor. Actually, this made the emperor practically a blind supporter of the war party. Mm. Nizam was called and he reached Delhi in 1737. He was immediately appointed governor of Malwa and he decided to drive the Marathas out of Malwa. With 30,000 troops, he advanced towards the Chambal River. Bajirao had 80,000 troops and he surrounded the army of Nizam, who had very good artillery. Therefore, the Marathas could not assault the camp of the Nizam, and Nizam could not come out of the camp. Actually, a famine started within the camp, and Nizam had to surrender, agree to hand over Malwa, and pay 50 lakh of rupees to Bajirao. He never paid this amount and Bajirao, at least for the time being, went back. By the time Bajirao had settled back in Maharashtra, Nadisha invaded India. There is no need to repeat what Nadisha did. He occupied Delhi, sacked it, took huge lot of money and went back to Persia 
including the peacock throne and the Kohinoor. After the departure of Nadesha, it was found that Sadat Ali was dead, the Wazir Kamaruddin Khan was dead, Khani Dauran was dead, the peace party had only Jai Singh, the most influential leader near Delhi, and in the war party Nizam. But Nizam was far off. It was at this juncture that Bajirao determined to force the issue. But before he could force it, in 1741 he died, and the third stage began with Nana Sahib as the Peshwa. Nana Sahib was not a general. He did not come from the military rank. He was far more practical in diplomacy, but he did not know much of the situation in North India because the last time he visited was in 1748. Now in 1741, Joy Singh managed to bring a peace treaty between the Mughals and the Marathas. The terms were very simple. Bajira or the Peshwa, then Nana Sahib, would be the governor, actually deputy governor under a prince who will never go there. And Chaut and Sardeshmukhi would be levied from Gujarat and from Malwa. Instead of 50 lakh of rupees which they demanded, 15 lakh should be given to them. And instead of the rest of the money, Chauth of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa were ceded. Now it is one thing to see the Chauth of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa in paper. It was another thing to collect it. Sahu, the king of the Marathas, appointed Roghuji Bhosle as the person to collect this amount and the area belonged to him. In 1741, Raghuji Bhonsle appeared in Bengal. He returned with some money and then again came back annually every year from 1743 onwards, ravaged the areas, Mennapur particularly, even reached once near Murshidabad, and Orissa. Finally, in 1751, Ali Khan, after desperate resistance, decided to call a halt to these wasteful programs and then signed a treaty with him, with Rogoje Hosle, that an annual choth of 12,000 rupees would be given to him each year. And in Odisha, there would be a Maratha governor appointed by Rokhoji who would practically control the entire Odisha. Odisha was ceded to the Marathas underhand. But this was not the only thing that Nana Sahib did. There was the question of the Deccan, because Nizam died in 1748. And after the death of Nizam, the French General Bussy became the controller of Hyderabad with his French troops. The Marathas now demanded Chaut. Bussy resisted. He was defeated. And in 1751, he was forced to 
cede a part of the Hyderabad area, including Khandesh, to the Marathas, along with the right to Levi Chowth. So these are the two principal gains of the Marathas during this stage, after 1741. But the Marathas were looking actually towards North India because that is where the plunder, prospect of plunder lies. In 1741 treaty, there was a clause that the Marathas would not cross the Chambal River, that is, they would not come to North India. So the Marathas continued to maintain that. But in the meanwhile, an opportunity came before them to intervene in the North. The princes of Rajasthan, instead of uniting them against the Marathas, began to fight among themselves. And even within a princely family, there were succession problems, succession fights and so on. Now earlier, the Mughal emperor used to decide those cases. There were cases even during the time of Aurangzeb when the state was taken over by the Mughals for the time being and so on and so forth. Now the Marathas, instead of the Mughals, became the supreme power by deciding these cases. With their force, they decided cases in favor of one or the other. And then they began to settle down there, taking their Chowth and Sardesmukhi, etc., in violation of the Treaty of 1741. At one point of time, it was becoming a case of clear oppression because the people of Rajasthan, particularly the peasants, were not rich. It's a very deficit state. Most of the Rajput princes and the nobles, they had their jagirs elsewhere, outside, from where their income comes. Most of the peasants, if they can, they join the Mughals in the army to fight. But in case of the Marathas, they don't need the Rajput fighters. They have their own army, which is also mercenary, and they had to be paid, but their own, recruited in the Deccan and in Maharashtra. And they now began their oppression on a very large scale. The inevitable result was in 1751, there was a revolt in Rajasthan against the Marathas, for which Sindhya and the Holkar should be made totally responsible, not the Peshwa or the king. Because Sindhya and Holkar did this kind of oppression, tried to get this, this amount of money by force. On one day, the citizens of Jaipur rose in revolt and killed all the Marathas who were there, including the Maratha general and the Maratha representative. It heralded the revolt in the countryside and any Maratha found anywhere was killed. This was the biggest blow to the Marathas in North India. Not the defeat so far, but the massacre of their citizens, massacre of their armies. Up to 1752, they could not take any decision and we do not go beyond 1752. 
Nana Sahib as a Peshwa was a very cultured man. During his time, he brought the Brahmins and the merchants from outside to settle in Pune, erected excellent buildings in Pune itself, made it a cultural center of Maharashtra, of the area. But he was, as I have said, a very poor general. And the problem is for him that he wanted not to fight in northern India because that would involve money. The finances would be in disarray. New investment has to be made because most of the Maratha soldiers had to be paid. But the Maratha Sardars, they do not want to remain idle. They wanted their autonomy and their plunder both at the same time. So therefore there was a pressure from below, one might say, of the Maratha Sardars on the Peshwa. And there, there was a pressure from the higher up finances, army organization, viability of the state to keep the status quo, not to go in for very deep fighting. A small plunder here and there is all right, but a detailed involvement in the fighting, Nana wanted to avoid. But after 1752, when the Duranis came to India to invade, he was unable to control his Maratha Sardars. Actually, Bajirao, during the time of Nadisha, was ordered by Sahu to join the Mughals. Bajirao straightway stated that unless he had a very huge force, he won't go. His force was then besieging the western coast of Basin from the Portuguese. Nana followed that kind of a policy that without a huge force, this cannot be done. But there is no money to pay for the huge force, so therefore this cannot be done. But then circumstances led him to do exactly what he wanted to avoid. And in the battle of Panipat, one third of the Maratha flower lay on the field with Maharashtra polity totally decimated.